welcome to International Hawaii. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, with Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone number nine. International Hawaii showcases local import and export businesses to help others that are new to the industry. And today, my guest is Jean-Paul Gideon, president of JPG Hawaii, a local marketing and advertising company. And they're also an FTZ9 customer. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me. <laughs> it is my pleasure. I've watched your show and I just love everything about the foreign trade zone. I'm happy to participate. That's awesome. We will get to that shortly. But I first wanted to ask you just about JPG Hawaii. What is your company briefly? And then how did you guys get started? All right. So we pronounced it as JPEG Hawaii. That's JPG Hawaii JPG when we're, you know, we're talking. But JPEG, like the picture file, because cool. we're a graphics company. It just so happens it's, it's also my initials, Jean-Paul Gideon. So it made sense. <laughs> All right. Nice. So 20 is now 21 years ago. I was in Kaiser High School and I took a class called Graphic Design and Communications. They taught us how to make stickers and use Adobe Photoshop and then make T-shirts. So JPEG Hawaii, what we've really grown to be is a full service uh, graphic design, printing, graphic installation and out-of-home advertising company. And our slogan is, we create what your business needs, plus we're nice. <laughs> the like niceness that. goes a long way, I'm to... telling you. <laughs> oh yeah, it's always good to work with nice people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice, and so just from your experience in high school, you thought, this is what I wanna do, and then. Okay, so here's the real thing, here's the real story. I was printing t-shirts in my kitchen with my mom, in 2000 and i was making volcom t-shirts it's a surf brand and i'm just making it for my friends mm -hmm. well i had the great idea why don't i sell some volcom stickers on ebay and in two weeks yeah. i had sold 800 dollars worth of these stickers uh <laughs> i didn't know the term was bootlegging but i was bootlegging so ebay froze nice. my account <laughs> paypal froze my account and then my yahoo email had a cease and desist order from volcom's lawyers and then I talked to them. They said, look, you can keep the $800. Just don't make any more stickers. And here's a contact of our rep in Kailua. So we became good friends. Actually, Volcom became a client of ours. We started printing custom hats for them. And we went legit with our first <laughs> order of T-shirts from Roy's restaurant, uh, 1,400 shirts. So <laughs> I got a good, uh, a good warning. So, <laughs> Go legit. So we've been so straight crazy. ever since. <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. That's awesome. <laughs> that yeah. is very cool. That's so crazy that you kind of just um not stumbled, but you know, just kind of yeah, bootlegged your way into the business, I guess. <laughs> Some say bootstrap, you gotta bootstrap, nice. but we bootlegged. Yeah. <laughs> We've always so been entrepreneurial. Like, um yeah. what my was... father is Go yeah. Ahead. I don't know, go ahead. Oh, I'll tell you the story. A short, yeah, short story. So we grew up in Hawaii Kai. I'm one of four brothers, the four Gideon brothers in Hawaii Kai. Went to Kaiser High School, the whole public school route. And we've always been entrepreneurial. Uh, we grew up in Queensgate in Hawaii Kai. So we lived right on the golf course, if you like by Sandy Beach and all that. So we would go out to the, the golf course and, you know, we'd play by the duck ponds or these ponds where people lose their ball in the water. We said, wow, look at all these balls. <laughs> So we would actually gather them up, put them in a bucket, wash them. And we had the crazy idea to sell a, a Safeway bag, you know, the plastic bags uh, full mm -hmm. of golf balls for five bucks. And the golfers mm -hmm. loved it. <laughs> and then we got kicked off the golf course because that's no vending. So we were right outside the gate <laughs> and we would sell the balls. And then my mom said, why don't you sell them, um, you know, lemonade? I said, well, we don't want to have a lemonade stand. She said, well, what about Hawaiian Sun juice? So we started selling juice for a dollar. So we would make money off the juice. We got the golf balls for free. And we we wanted to buy Nintendo. Mm -hmm. This is like 1986 or seven. My mom <laughs> said, yeah, you can get a Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Buy it yourself. You know how to make money. So we did it. We made money. And ever since then, my brothers and I, we worked together. So we've done a lot of That's selling awesome. of things over the years. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> So when you started, like legitimately started your business, what was the biggest challenge to starting in Hawaii, especially? Well, the biggest challenge is, well, legally, how do we get started? 
because <laughs> we would we would always have side businesses and you know people pay us cash or check but then we started mm-hmm. working with a company like Roy's and 1400 mm-hmm. shirts now they're paying you know a sizable check which i think mm-hmm. it was maybe only 6000 at the time but we needed to have um you know a business account because they wanted to send us mm-hmm. or make us fill out a w9 so we can get a 1099 i said mm-hmm. what is all what are these numbers what are these forms <laughs> my aunt, yeah my auntie madeline gideon she uh, madeline shaw excuse me madeline shaw she signed us up uh we went to the dcca ehoy.gov now you know you register your company uh, get a bank account and mm-hmm. get all, le- all your legal ducks in line. So we did that. And that was the biggest challenge. Just not knowing how there was no internet, you know, in 2001, by the mm, time we did this, true. it was like real basic internet. But um, she, my, my auntie ran this office, basic office services is her company. And she just walked us through the steps. So oh, thank perfect. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Aunties are the best. <laughs> this is the, yeah, real, my real auntie, not my auntie kind like that. But real empty. So that was good. <laughs> nice. Um, how have you seen like just advertising change from when you started? Like, I, I know things are constantly changing with the internet, with social media. And then you also mentioned out of home advertising. I've never really heard yeah. of that, that term either. I'm so glad you said how that. Have you know, seen things the... change like when you started? <laughs> okay. When we first started i mean when we would sell so like i said we sold a lot of things from golf balls to cars to many things but when we were first starting the advertising that we we win is the newspaper it was i think a honolulu advertiser at the time Mm -hmm. and to put a classified ad was for a little square it was like 75 dollars i forgot how many words or characters you could put it was 75 bucks you put it in the paper the phone actually rang and then we got listed in the yellow pages and <laughs> the phone actually rang. You know, people would call. We had cell phones then. It wasn't touchscreen, but it was phones. And we've seen it change to where mm-hmm. one thing remained constant is that if you could get someone to see your ad, whatever it may be, there was three components you mm-hmm. needed. And this this is for old school. I'm saying like caveman writing all the way till digital advertising now. <laughs> there was three things who you are, what you do, and how to get a hold of you. That was it. So it's really the same. It's just the barrier to entry is so much lower where it's a lot easier to get in and buy ads and and to be seen by people. When we started, it was really the newspaper was the king. The yellow pages were the queen. That was and, expensive too. I mean, yeah, 75 bucks back then. You know, that was maybe like 150 now. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so that's always thought it's a lot there's more options now and it's just more there's more ways to get out there but it's really mm-hmm. it's really the same and different at the same time if that makes sense so what is what is out of home advertising okay you proved my point exactly in the industry out of home advertising is <laughs> anything that is not traditional advertising it's not the newspaper it's not the mm-hmm. magazine, it's not television, and it's not the radio, mm-hmm. TV. Yeah. So anything out of the home mm-hmm. is what we call it, out of home advertising. This is your roadside billboards. This is the ads you see on the grocery dividers, like these, when, you, when you're at the, the checkout lanes. It's the mm-hmm. vehicles that are wrapped in graphics, you know, the, the big trucks that have big graphics on them. It's anything out of the home. And it's mm-hmm. just such a huge term. A lot of people don't know it, but we could call it billboards. You can call it supermarket ads, you know? So it's anything that's outside of the home. So glad you asked that question. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, that's a new term for me, so, but it makes sense. Those, I mean, it's yeah. pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> it's also referred to as OOH, the acronym out of home. So OOH, if you just Google that, you'll see a whole mm-hmm. bunch of just all sorts of creative ways that people are putting advertising on almost every surface you can think of. Nice. Oh, I can see some images here of some of your work. Very nice. Right, yeah. Yeah, and then you see so them operate, all over the place. Yeah, you may not even know that it's an, it's an ad that you could buy. So, for instance, with us, I just showed this. This is a grocery divider. It separates your grocery mm-hmm. on the checkout lane, on the conveyor belt. Mm-hmm. So I actually designed this, manufactured it, got a patent for it in the U.S. and 
multiple countries where we can slide and add in and out of this thing. So it's very easy to change, change out your advertiser. So if you're at a supermarket, whether it's Times or Safeway or Longs, people are spending mm -hmm. between three to five minutes in the lane. Mm -hmm. And the majority of advertisers we see are, you know, the healthcare industry, uh, real estate agents is the number one advertiser because they want to really be a part of the community. They need their face to be seen. And if they sell one home, these ads, they run between 350 and 500 a month and mm -hmm. you get all the lanes. So it's a really good way to be seen. <laughs> I know that sounded like a pitch, but I'm on autopilot here. <laughs> but that's so amazing that you patented right. it. That's very cool. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, so we'll go into the education part of foreign trade zone later, but it ties back to that, the patent. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask. So being foreign trade zone, like what do you, what do you import? What kind of things do you use the foreign trade zone for? Well, mainly we use the foreign trade zone for our storage. We have excellent pricing and nice facility, with this, which is all um, documented, inventory, categorized. In, and it's not only in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Every state has a foreign trade zone. I think not enough people utilize it, mm -hmm. but I love the pricing. I mean, we have friends in the self-storage space, and I love them <laughs> all. But when it comes to the pricing, and that's what it came down to, the pricing, the security, of the of the inventory and how mm -hmm. it's documented, we love it. We love mm -hmm. the foreign trade zone for that. And so, do you, what do you bring in? You bring in your marketing materials, or what are you storing? Well, that's confidential. If I told you, I'd have to. <laughs> never mind. I'll tell you the real. Okay. So, yeah. So this ties in so to what I was going to get to about our pivot and where we really uh, in 2020, how we were able to you know, not only have our company survive, but keep our, our, all of our staff and, and do some good for the community at the same time was back in March when the pandemic really hit Hawaii, we had the, the shutdown orders, there was a real break in the supply mm -hmm. chain. I don't know if people knew, but with all the commercial flights and even um, just passenger flights ceasing, Stuff. A lot of the mm -hmm. cargo was moved on, on your passenger flights. It's below you, like Hawaiian Airlines and Delta and mm. Continental, everyone else, Southwest, they've ceased to fly, which means all those packages needed to go somewhere. So mm -hmm. if you're getting things from China, for instance, you were seeing UPS, FedEx, DHL, their prices shot up 8, 10, 1100 mm. percent. Insane pricing. So we helped bridge the gap in the supply chain of PPE, personal protective equipment. These are your masks. This is your sanitizer stations, your gloves, your gowns, your booties. Everything that the hospitals, the care homes, and any other mm -hmm. facility needs. We, we had sources already to bring in hand sanitizer and promotional products, wow. you know, custom pens and like these um, custom drinkware. All of this stuff. So <laughs> it really comes down to logistics and sourcing. So mm -hmm. because yeah. we had all of our sourcing capabilities locked up, we were able to just say, hey, what is needed? What can we supply? And how can we bridge that gap in the broken supply chain? Distributors locally were mm -hmm. sold out. They couldn't get any more product. The airlines were locked down. So we only had a few commercial flights coming through. Those were backed mm -hmm. up for like a week at the docks. It was it was really crazy and it still hasn't fully recovered. You know, the pricing stayed mm -hmm. high. The the amount of cargo that's moving has remained slow. But we were able to bridge the gap. So what we did, we're storing a lot of the PPE for a lot of the care homes, uh, the hospitals we work with, the hotels we work with, uh, the commercial buildings we work with. So it was great. We couldn't store all this. Like we were bringing in container loads. So there's no way we mm -hmm. can store this in our small Waikiki office. <laughs> it just wouldn't work so foreign trade zone nice. came to the rescue oh perfect um how did you you said you had all your sourcing connections locked up how did you find them in the first place like how do you find your suppliers well here, here's the secret sauce his name is joe gideon my oldest brother <laughs> and my business partner yeah uh -huh. so uh, years back 
he was really fascinated in being able to sell multiple products to one company and for JPEG to become a one-stop shop because we found that our clients, you know, we're working with marketing managers, we're working with um, mm -hmm. sometimes the CEOs or entrepreneurs in their own company. And if you're going to order pens and drinkware and signs and banners and vehicle graphics, you're dealing with maybe five or six different vendors and they all have a different way of doing business and they may not know your brand standards and your logos. They mm -hmm. don't have your designs. So you have to send it to each one of them. And it became a real mm -hmm. pain point for them. So mm -hmm. my brother, Joe, he's very, very talented in, in making a solid supply chain and logistics. So he said, okay, here's mm -hmm. the pain point for our clients. And they like us because we're nice. So if we can work with them <laughs> across a multitude and really simplify the way they do their job, they can actually focus on doing their mm -hmm. job instead of trying to be a logistics mm -hmm. manager when they're a marketing manager. So Joe Gideon, he's, he's the one who really found it. Nice. We've joined some organizations who are out there. Some are, um, ASI is one of them, Advertising Specialty Institute. That's one you can join. It's, these are all paid memberships. And you really, it opens you up to a whole world of suppliers, manufacturers locally, okay. overseas, Alibaba, global sourcing, enter at your own risk kind of a game. But once you vet, <laughs> once you vet your supply chain, what I meant we have it on lock is that we have mm -hmm. relationships with these companies and we've done business before. So we know what we can rely upon them for and leverage the strengths. So did, did Joe actually go out and meet the suppliers and see their facilities or is this just based on the organization's connections that you started relationships? No, no, there's conferences. So there's conferences, you know, before the pandemic, mm. there's, there's trade shows in Vegas, there's Long yeah. Beach, there's Chicago, there's New York and the Javits Center. So you go there, you meet the people face to face, which I always recommend, get to know who you're working mm -hmm. with. Because, you're, and then, yeah. you know, you actually get a better relationship and you're not just a customer, you become mm -hmm. a person. And then you know them mm -hmm. and we send them macadamia nuts, you know, and coffee. And then they'll send us <laughs> back whatever theirs are, like some taffy. And now we've built a, a rapport. So they're more mm -hmm. inclined to help us because we're friends. Just mm -hmm. like Hawaii. You know how Hawaii is a small island. We all play in the same sandbox. It's the same mm -hmm. thing. We get out to the trade shows. We keep up to date with industry news. And we participate like we're doing now mm -hmm. on, on your show is where mm -hmm. we participate in the conversation to help move the industry to help move the economy and the whole business network forward that's the only way to survive and, and thrive mm -hmm. you don't want to just sit back well mm -hmm. maybe some people do but not us <laughs> nice um we have a question from a viewer they're asking what's more important to have in your line of work is it being creative and artistic or is it being good at graphic design, which I'm thinking is like the technical part? So, you know, there's a couple parts there. So the question I would say is there's artists and there's designers. Artists are creators. Hmm. I would categorize an artist mm -hmm. as a creator. A designer can take art or elements that have been created and DJ them together. Like a DJ would mix up the song and you know, you can curate them. So mm -hmm. I don't say one is more important than the other. It really depends on the project. I can speak from my own experience because I'm a creative, I, I'm an artist, I, I make my own art. I did not take this photo. So I would be a designer. I did not take this photo. I did not of Audrey Hepburn. I didn't take the photo of this chain link right here. But what I did, mm -hmm. I designed it, I curated it together with my own style and printed it. So the same thing we do with Joe and the suppliers, he basically mm -hmm. curated a bunch of the suppliers. So he was creative in how he arranged things and did the business. So I would say they're equally important. And depending on what project you're working on, there's going to be something that is just much more important. So if you want to, if you want to get any more answers, you can email me jpg at jpghawaii.com. <laughs> Again, that's jpg at jpghawaii.com. I'd be happy to send you a longer um, explanation. Perfect. Um, what, is, what do you see as the future for JPEG Hawaii? And what are some of the challenges that you're facing? Challenges. 
Okay, this is, I was just talking about this on, on our meeting. So every weekday, we jump on Zoom. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's eight of us on our team. Uh, three of us are working remotely. Five are in the office doing production and all the work there. So mm -hmm. huge challenge is working remotely in this hybrid model that we have, where some people are in the mm -hmm. office, they got the day-to-day, -day, they have the, you know, the micro interactions with each other. Others is where mm -hmm. us working remotely, unless we reach out for a specific reason, we're not getting that, you know, close, close communication. It's really only what we see yeah. from 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Luckily, mm -hmm. the tools have helped us bridge that gap in communication. What we see the future is, and I'll touch on just from a couple points. One is the, the workspace. The future I see of the workspace, we're going to be moving into a larger facility. We're in an office environment now mm -hmm. where we do printing and production, and we've kind of grown out of that. Now we're getting a, a larger warehouse in Kaka'ako, where if we're doing vehicle graphics, like vehicle wraps on trucks, and mm -hmm. you've seen our work out there, you may just not have known it's us, we can now drive big vehicles into our property, close our roll-up doors, and a lot of the inventory, will still keep it foreign trade zone for our boxes, but we'll also mm -hmm. have the things that come and go fast in our own facility. So the future for us is moving into more of a warehouse environment because we've seen offices really hurting. And it's the future for office mm -hmm. spaces. They're going to be a challenge because now people know they can work remotely and mm -hmm. make it work <laughs> to a certain extent. And we've moved from office to industrial. So we're mm -hmm. out of the office space. We're going to industrial because we have mm -hmm. warehouse with an office in it. Mm -hmm. And then the last <laughs> thing I would say about the future is it's no question technology has moved us forward people who have wouldn't have been on facebook or zoom and video call they're on it we're on it think tech is adopted it a long time ago so you guys were ahead of the curve but there's no going back so if you want to really own your audience and be connected a huge recommendation this doesn't come from me this come comes from an advertising, marketing, branding guru. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. He goes by Gary V. Just type in the word Gary into mm -hmm. Google, G-A-R-Y, and it'll pop up. He's the biggest on like every platform. Um, <laughs> I was on a call with him and I asked him about what we can do you know, to move forward. And he said, start a media property. So what do you mean a media property? He said, start a podcast, start a show. You know, you can be on all these different platforms like Instagram mm. and Facebook and LinkedIn, but you don't actually own your audience. You can get turned mm -hmm. off at any time. They can filter the results. They can make you pay to play. Like if you're a company on Facebook mm -hmm. and you post on your Facebook page as a company, you get no reach. You need to pay to amplify that. If you're a person and you post on your profile, you may still get reach. <laughs> but he said, start out your own uh, media property. So we started a show. Mm -hmm. It's the JPEG podcast was our core of a name, but he said, you've got to be more specific, Jean-Paul. No one's going to find it if it's called the JPEG podcast. So he said, call it Hawaii Business Now. So <laughs> maybe I can have you on my show too, hawaiibusinessnow.com. It'll take you to our YouTube <laughs> playlist. We've interviewed anyone from Rob Burns, the founder of Local Motion, to other members of the Entrepreneurs Organization. And we've, we've spoken mm -hmm. of the foreign trade zone and, and how it's really been a game changer for us. I just speak the praises of them, of you guys all the time. Oh, nice. That's awesome. And I saw that you had a shipping company too. That was interesting. Just yes, Because yes. people don't understand. Like, I think you take for granted all the stuff that you see in the grocery store and you don't even think about how it actually got here, right? And it's, it's a windy road to get to Hawaii. <laughs> it's a windy road. It's a turbulent sea. That was uh, Sagey exactly. Aspengren from Landmark Logistics and Aloha Freight mm -hmm. Forwarders. So they're the guys who bring in the, they have, they get space on the large ships mm -hmm. and they bring it in. They actually do the trucking to all of the times, the longs, the Safeways, the Costco's. These are the guys who help Hawaii get what we need because we import everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, we have a, a quick video if you wanted to, if we can take a look at, I guess. Some I'd of love your... to see I'd love to see I'm some of our work on video.
that was exciting. Wow, there's so many um, diverse places you can have advertising. <laughs> it's right. Over the place. I guess where there, wherever there's blank space, right? You could put an ad. <laughs> yeah, so some of that was advertising, and then some of it was was uh, um, companies branding their own their own um, vehicles mm-hmm. or for their own purposes. What is the most effective way to advertise for, let's say, a startup or like a small company that doesn't have a big budget to do something like super splashy? I would say the best thing to do, first thing is get yourself a domain name, a website name. Go to GoDaddy and see if your name is available. So if it's um, Cindy's Cookies, you know, and you want to do that, just go to Cindy's Cookies, does it .com? Oh, it's available. (laughs) Grab that name. Next. You want to be on the mm-hmm. top seven social media platforms to get found. Find this, do the same name, Cindy's Cookies on Facebook, mm-hmm. Instagram, LinkedIn, Yelp, Google My Business. That's a huge one. They're really competing with Yelp. And then, you know, you get your Snapchat, get your YouTube channel. That's all free. Mm-hmm. Do that first. Mm-hmm. It's all free and you will be found. Like it or not. <laughs> That yeah. is good advice. Very good. And one last random question before we close out our show. What has been your pandemic activity pastime? What have you been doing with yourself during this time? <laughs> so I've leaned, I've leaned into technology. I love going on webinars. I love to be a part of the community. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so many people are actually getting on either Zoom happy hours or there's an app called Clubhouse where you can get in and be a part of the conversation. Is just connecting with people virtually. It's been a game changer for me uh, huh. personally in my in my like mental health and life of interacting with people, but as business as well. I'm connecting with people I would have seen at a trade show for five seconds, but now I'm on there for like an hour. That's true. I feel like there's so much more content that you have available now that people are putting it up online. Like a lot of stuff that you would have to pay to fly to go to the mainland and go to like a trade show or a conference. Now it's all like you can sit at home and watch it, which is nice. It's very nice. But thank you so much, John Paul, for joining me on International Hawaii. It was really great to talk to you. So final thought, what I would say is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And we haven't done that. So instead of reinventing the wheel, Mm -hmm. step on the gas, move forward. People have done (laughs) what you want to do before. Take what Mm -hmm. they've laid out for you step on the gas and move forward. And it's okay if you hit some potholes on the way, just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's great advice and do it better. That's right. I'm on ThinkTech on International Hawaii. Yeah.